Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so can you hear me? Good. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to the afternoon session. And I just have a quick announcement that the snacks will be ready in Vincent Hall uh, at late by 2.30. So you can enjoy. And uh, uh, for the afternoon session, we're happy to have our first speaker, David Speyer from University of Michigan. And uh, he will talk about the Cox combinatorics. Here you go, David. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to say thank you to all the organizers and thank you to everyone who came. It is so good to be back talking math with all of you and hearing about new problems. So this talk, by the way, I assume the audio was good. Cool. So this talk is about how to put Coxeter groups and weak order on Coxeter groups inside some larger structure. So the bottom half of this picture is the weak order on the affine symmetric group of rank two. And the top half of this picture is question marks because this talk is about trying to put something above there. And compared to the other talks, this is much more going to be a structural talk and not an enumerative talk. It's about can you find these structures? So what I should tell you is what is a Coxeter group and what is weak order on it? And I should spend a little time telling you why I want to put it inside something larger. But this is going to be a little bit like Sergey's talk where he told you, you know, trust me, quiver mutation is important. <laughs> so that why will go a bit fast because I want to get to the how, I want to talk about two strategies for making something larger like this. And neither of them is my strategy. The first one has been really spearheaded by Matthew Dyer. And it, you, it's the uh, theory of bi-closed sets of positive roots. And the second one has really been spearheaded by Nathan Reading using his ideas about shards. Okay, so what is a Coxeter group? Well, the quickest definition is that Coxeter groups are given with generators and relations. The generators are called S1, S2, blah, 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 SR. And the relations are, first of all, each of the SIs squares the identity. And then SIJ has some prescribed order. So we might say S1 times S2 is going to have order 17, and S1 times S3 is going to have order 79, and S2 times S3 is going to have order 4, and that would be a Coxeter group. And that's a definition as an abstract group with generators and relations, but Coxeter groups always come with linear representations. And in these linear representations, the, the SI acts by a reflection, meaning it fixes a co-dimension one subspace and negates a complementary line. And we can even think of them acting on a vector space V where the lines that are negated are nice. They're called alpha one through alpha R. They're called the simple roots and SI negates the simple root alpha I. Or we can think about the action on the dual space in which case SI fixes the orthogonal or plane complementary to alpha I. So sometimes there will be a pop Sometimes there will be a non-degenerate bilinear form and you can identify V and V dual, and sometimes there won't, but I'll try to be careful to put V and V dual up so I'll still be okay when you can't. Okay. So we should have three, so we're gonna have three examples. One example is gonna be the symmetric group. Uh, we, I was gonna say every talk in this conference is mentioned a symmetric group, but I actually don't think that's true, but a very large number of them have. Um, and that's going to be a finite Coxeter group. We're not going to want to make that any bigger. The finite Coxeter groups are big enough. We're going to want to enlarge the infinite Coxeter groups. <laughs> so the symmetric group Sn is generated by S1, S2, dot, 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 Sn minus one, where Si is the transposition that interchanges I and I plus one. So for example, S1 interchanges one and two, S2 interchanges at two and three, S1, S2 is a three cycle on one, two, three. So it has order three. So S1, S2 has order three. Whereas S1, S3, for example, has order two. And it's a very classical theorem that if you take a group with those generators relations, you do in fact get the symmetric group and not some larger extension of it. What's the geometric representation of it? Well, essentially we're going to take Rn and let Sn act by permuting coordinates. So alpha i, remember, is supposed to be the negative one eigenvector of the reflection Si. So for example, S1 switches coordinates one and two. So that negates E2 minus E1. So E2 minus E1 is going to be my alpha one. And in general, my alpha i is going to be Ei plus one minus Ei. Um, 
except I told you that the alphas were going to be a basis and I've given you n minus one vectors in n dimensional space. So if I'm going to uh, match up with the formalism I told you at the beginning to be pedantic, V is the n minus one plane orthogonal complement to the all ones vector. And the dual thing to taking a subspace is taking a quotient space. So V dual is all n module of the all ones vector. So what I've drawn on the right-hand side of this slide is I've drawn R3 modulo R times one, one, one. So it's a two-dimensional vector space. It has coordinates Z1, Z2, Z3. And I've drawn in at the hyperplanes, Z1 equals Z2. That's orthogonal to E2 minus E1. Z2 equals Z3. That's orthogonal to E2 minus E3. And uh, Z1 equals Z3. That's orthogonal to E3 minus E1. And as you can see, these three choose two hyperplanes divide this space up into three factorial regions according to the orders of disease. And in general, we're going to have n choose two hyperplanes dividing up an n minus one dimensional space into n factorial regions. The regions are indexed by the elements of our Coxeter group, and the Coxeter group acts by reflections over those hyperplanes. Okay, so this is a finite example, and now I wanted to give you two infinite examples. So the affine symmetric group is a group of permutations, not of a finite set, but of all the integers, which obey this sort of shift periodicity relation that F of A plus N is F of A plus N, and also this normalization condition that you can ignore. Um, so if you think about this as an infinity by infinity permutation matrix, then this condition here says that if you shift down into the right by n, your, the, your permutation matrix is periodic for that. And so my generators are S1, S2, Sn, where roughly Si switches i and i plus one, but this periodicity says if I switch i and i plus one, I also have to switch i plus n and i plus n plus one, i plus two n and i plus two n plus one and so forth. So for example, here is the generator S1 when n equals five, I switch one and two, but then I also have to switch one plus five and two plus five and so forth ad infinitum. So this generates some permutation group of the integers. And many of you have seen this before, but I'm sure some haven't. How are we going to get a vector space this acts on? You might think it's an infinite permutation group, so I need an infinite vector space, but I don't. Oh, sorry, I need an infinite dimensional vector space, sorry, but I don't. It's going to be a finite dimensional vector space. It's going to be, so, oh, I'm going to look at the vector space of infinite real sequences, which have a periodicity that zi plus n is zi plus d for some constant d. So this has dimension n plus one, you specify the values of z1, z2, z3 up to zn, and you specify d, and that gives you a sequence. And then the affine permutations act on this vector space by permuting the subscripts, because they clearly are going to preserve that property. So that's going to be my vector space where the hyperplanes live, or almost, there's a caveat at the bottom of the slide. Um, where do the alphas live? Well, they live in the dual vector space. So for every integer a, let ea be evaluation at a, that's a linear functional on my vector space of sequences. So it lives in the dual vector space. So for every integer, I have a vector ea in the vector space, in the dual vector space. <coughs> I have an infinite sequence of vectors in n plus one dimensional vector space, and they obey that E a plus n minus E a is some vector delta that doesn't depend on a. And our alpha i, well, it's the thing that's negated by interchanging i and i plus one, that's E i plus one minus E i. And then at the bottom is the same caveat as for the symmetric group. I said the alphas were going to be a basis. I've got a vector space that's one too large. So if you're being pedantic, you should take your actual vector space to be the span of the alphas. That's the vector space spanned by EI minus EJ. And the dual thing is in this vector space of by infinite sequences, you should quotient by the constant sequences. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, sequences in this space, if there exists a D. So the constant sequences are in this space, they're in this space with D equals zero. And they form a, a, a subspace, so I'm allowed to take the quotient by it. That's right, that's right, this is a vector space. 
So you might like to take an affine slice through this vector space. You might like to fix D equals one. Then I would get an affine reflection representation by trying to give it, by trying to put everything on a uniform footing and always have a linear representation. I try to do that because a bunch of reasons. So So here's my vector space of all sequences. There are hyperplanes through this vector space. You could put D equals zero or D equals one, or you could put D equals negative one. Those are gonna be slices through this vector space. And if you look at, and the action preserves this D, so oh, the action takes these hyperplane to itself. If you look at it as an action, in this fixed hyperplane, then it's an reflection by the af. Then it's a reflection representation of the affine linear group with reflections over affine hyperplanes. That's another way people like to draw this picture, but I don't want to draw it that way today, and I don't want to because first of all, my talk is going to be about enlarging, and a lot of the things I want to add. Half of my enlargement, more or less, lives down here, so I don't want to miss half my picture, and I also want to be allowed to talk about roots. And so roots come up most naturally from linear representations. Thank you. Uh, I spent some detail on this because I'm eventually going to do computations of this space. So I wanted to make sure people are happy that, yes, it really makes sense to write down all these coordinates I'm writing down. So I really do have vectors called EI for each integer I. And my root alpha I really is EI plus one minus EI. And I have this periodicity EI plus N minus EI is delta. Okay, uh, I want to move to the third example. People are happy with that? <clears throat> okay, so the third example is going to be a free Coxeter group, but I'll do it at rank three. So by free Coxeter group, I mean I take the Mij's to all be infinity. So my only relations are Si squared equals S, Si S1 squared equals S2 squared equals S3 squared equals the identity. You can think about this geometrically in the hyperbolic plane. So take this ideal triangle, it's a triangle all three of whose angles are zero, and take the reflections over its sides, and you get this pattern of triangles covering the hyperbolic plane, and that hyperbolic reflection group, that's the free Coxeter group of rank three. Now, you might say you're violating the principle that you just set out, you're going to do everything linearly, but that's on the next slide. If we use the, hyper, the hyperboid model for hyperbolic space, which means we think about the hyperbolic plane as one of two sheets of a hyperboloid, of a two-sheeted hyperboloid, then each of these hyperbolic lines are the intersection of the hyperboloid with an honest to goodness linear space. And the hyperbolic reflections are honest to goodness linear reflections in this three-dimensional space. And so we really do have a linear reflection group preserving a form of signature plus plus minus alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are space-like vectors in the sense of special relativity sticking out the sides of the light cone. So I decided not to put up just the general formulas, but the general formulas aren't bad. I can write them down for you if you like them or you can look them up. But for any Coxeter group whatsoever, there are formulas for how you write down this video representation. And you always get this setup where there are, are, are simple root vectors, alpha one, alpha two, up through alpha r your negation, your SI negates alpha I, and so it acts on the dual space preserving alpha I prime. Okay, so that was Coxer group, same over to be weak order. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, actually, okay, the question was, does the signature turn by the Coxer group? So here are some true statements that are close to what you said. Positive signature is equivalent to finite. Semi-definite signature is equivalent to product of affines and finites. Um, and there's also a description of hyperbolic, which is more or less a bunch of pluses and one minus, but I'm skipping over something. Um, now, if you know this theory well enough, you know you have the freedom to choose certain entries of the Cartan matrix corresponding to when Mij is infinite. So if Mij is infinite, then Aij can be anything in less than negative two. And I don't actually know if that can change the signature. I know it can't change it in or out of those cases where we have the classification. It can? Okay, thank you. Um, so if you know this theory, you know that there's, uh, the AIJ is called the Carton matrix, that when MIJ is finite, the AIJs are fixed, 
but when MIJ is infinite, you have a choice of AIJ, and apparently that can change the signature, although it can't change it, you know, out of any of these nice cases, the finite, right, affine hyperbolic cases. Thanks. Okay. So, so at this point, I should define weak order because it's in my title. And the nice geometric definition is going to come in a bit after I've set up roots and inversions. But I can give you the really quick definition now. So, a, if we have a word, SI1, SI2, SIL, in my generators S1 through SR, that's called a reduced word if it's of the shortest length of all words for its product. And then weak order is the partial order where U is less than or equal to V if there's a reduced word for V whose prefix is a reduced word for U. It will automatically be reduced. So whose prefix is a word for you? <clears throat> and so on this slide here is weak order on the symmetric group S3. So S2 is less than S2, S1 because it's prefix of S2, S1. S1, S2 has prefix S1, S2, sorry, S1, S2, S1 has prefix S1, S2, but also S1, S2, S1 equals S2, S1, S2. So it also has prefix S2, S1. And so that's the weak order on S3. Over on the other side, here is the free Coxeter group of rank two, which is also the affine symmetric group of rank two. There are no, the only relations are S1 squared and S2 squared of the identity. So we get two infinite chains going up without that. And that was the bottom half of my cover slide. So the other piece of background I want to do in terms of like classical Coxeter background is I want to tell you what root systems are and what inversions are. So remember we have this alpha one, alpha two, alpha, which would be an R basis of our space. The roots are the W orbit of the alphas. And the non-trivial fact that every root is either a positive root, meaning it's in the not in the non-negative span of the alphas, or a negative root, meaning it's in the, uh, the negative span of the alphas. And so we can break up our root system, capital phi, into positive roots, phi plus, and negative roots, phi minus. So in the symmetric group, the roots are ej minus ei for i not equal to j, and the positive roots are ej minus ei with my sign conventions for i less than j. In the affine symmetric group, the roots are ej minus ei for j not equivalent to i mod n. If you think about what happens to e2 minus e1 as you move it around, two and one can't collide mod n with those permutations. And the positive roots are ej minus ei for i less than j and i not equal to j mod n. And so here I've drawn you the root systems for the symmetric group on three letters and the affine symmetric group of rank two. So for example, alpha one, that's E2 minus E1. Alpha two, that's E3 minus E2. Alpha one plus alpha two, that's E3 minus E1, that's delta. And all the other roots are on these two parallel lines where I translate by delta. And I'm not going to draw you the hyperbolic root system, although you'll probably make a pretty picture if I had time to prepare it. Okay, those are roots, roots live in V. The hyperplanes dual to the roots live in V dual. So here are the hyperplanes dual to the roots for S3. They divide uh, my space up into three factorial regions indexed by elements of the Coxeter group. Here are the roots dual to my affine root system. They divide my vector space up into regions. And I want to discuss in what sense they are and are not indexed by elements of the Coxeter group. So I'm going to write D for those vectors in the dual which pair positively with all the alpha i's. So on this slide, D is down here. It's Z1 less than Z2 less than Z3. And on this slide, D is over here. It's the increasing by infinite sequences. And, and over here we see that each one of the components of this hyperplane arrangement complement is of the form UD for a unique U. On this slide, we see that the things that are colored U, oh, sorry, the things that are colored blue are also UD, but there's lots of white things that are not UD. And so the theorem is 
if you look at the UD as U ranges over your coxeter group, you always get disjoint open simplicial cones. In finite type, they are exactly the regions of the complement. But in general, they are those regions which are on the positive side of all but finitely many hyperplanes. So these guys, so D is on the positive side of every hyperplane, S1 D is on the positive side of every hyperplane except alpha one perp and so forth. But if you try to cross over to this white side, you have to go through infinitely many hyperplanes and, and you weave what's called the tips cone, you weave the UDs. And then vocabulary was a pure group theoretic way to define this, but I'm going to give you the geometry way because I find it a lot more intuitive. We say that a root beta is an inversion of U if inner product of beta is negative on UD. And the theorem is you can describe weak order by containment of inversion sets. So U is less than V in weak, in weak order if it only have inversions of U or contains in inversions of V. Okay, this is all sort of extremely classical Coxeter stuff. But you know, every year there are new grad students who should learn. Okay, so, and I think the first really surprising, interesting fact about weak order as a poset is that it's a complete lattice, or rather, finite weak order is a complete lattice. So, what a complete lattice means: a complete lattice is a poset where, when you take any subset, it has a unique greatest upper bound, sorry, least upper bound at a unique greatest lower bound. And the finite type weak orders have exactly that property. The infinite ones are what are called complete meet semi lattices. Those are posets where you're, you're, um, where taking meets, taking lower bounds is pretty good. Every subset has a greatest lower bound except the empty set. But taking in joins, if there is an upper bound, then there is a least upper bound, but there may be no upper bound at all. So S1 and S2, and also this infinite ascending chain up here or up here, those don't have upper bounds at all. But we at least have this semi lattice property that if there's an upper bound, there's a unique one. That's if there's a, then there's a unique least one. That's right. So my next few slides, so I'm going to address that too. So if all I wanted was to put this complete meet semi lattice inside a complete lattice, then I would just put one more element up on top and I would win. If you take a complete meet semi lattice and throw one element on top, you always get a complete lattice. It is the meat of the empty set and is the joint of everything it didn't have a joint before. Uh, this is not what I want to do. Yeah? Uh, wait, what's the difference between a lattice and a lattice? In a lattice, you only impose this for finite sets X and in some textbooks, you always impose it for non-empty finite sets X. Okay. Uh, I never want to address that issue, so things will always be complete for me. Other questions? Okay. So I want to embed W into a larger complete lattice in the infinite case. And here's what I want it to look like for the affine symmetric group of rank two. I want there to be a join of this chain. I want there to be a different join of this chain. I want there to be a whole second copy of the cock, of the Coxeter group upside down with a max wall right up here. You might wonder why do I want all that when I could just put in one element. And the reason is that my motivations tell me I want some very particular things. So what are my motivations? Well, one motivation is complete lattices are nice. But if all I want is a complete lattice, I just put one thing up top. So let's talk about other motivations. Okay. These are all going to be rushed a bit. So what can we do with Coxeter groups? One thing we could do with Coxeter groups, if this is how I got into this story, is we could describe cluster algebras. We could describe cluster complexes and G vector fans in terms of the combinatorics of Coxeter groups. And when you do this for finite type cluster algebras, everything works out really well. There's lots of papers that have done all of this. When you try and do this for infinite cluster algebras, what you find is you can only describe a portion of the cluster complex of a portion of the G vector fan. That's exactly in the same way that the Coxeter group only covers a portion of the representation space. You're missing all the stuff that goes down here. Or in hyperbolic cases, you're missing everything outside the forward white cone. You're sort of looking at the world through a tits cone shaped keyhole. 
So I would like a larger structure to describe the rest of the cluster complex, the rest of the G vector thing. Another thing that Cochrane groups describe besides cluster algebras are they describe representation theory of pre-projective algebras. And it's the same story. If you have a finite type pre-projective algebra, then we have a really great understanding of the representation theory. Here are some of the names associated to that. But if you try to do an infinite type pre-projective algebra, you only get some of the representation theory and it's, a, it's exactly the same gap again. You see the stuff that's up here and you don't see the stuff that's down here. And then finally, this is a bit of an older thing, but both the authors are in the room, so I'd like to cite this. Uh, Lam and Poyovsky have some very nice work on total positivity for loop groups, where they wind up indexing things by affine coxeter groups. And they wind up needing sort of a partial compactification, which from a lattice perspective, what they're doing is they are throwing in joins for ascending chains. So if I go back to slides, they find it natural to put in this element that's at the joint of this and put in this element that's at the joint of this. And for their purposes, they don't need to go further. They don't need to put in a joint of S1 and S2. But I, it certainly might be worth going back to their paper and seeing whether there would be a reason to do that. And certainly from a lattice theory perspective, it's a natural thing to ask for. So we want whatever we find to recover what Lam and Piriofsky found. So these are the sort of things that tell me I want very specific answers, like the very specific answer I just showed you. Okay, that was the what are Coxeter groups, what is weak order, why do I want to extend weak order, and the second half of the talk is the how. This is a good point for me to pause and see whether there are other questions or places I can help people. Yeah. It is not. We're coming to that. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Rick. Um, okay, so she's probably she's probably complaining about the whiteboard here not being visible on Zoom. <laughs> Trisha, you may unmute yourself. Yeah, when you were saying we want these different joins, I couldn't see what you were referring to. I mean, I could maybe guess, but. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. Because I can't but, see the pointer. Right, right. So let's, let's use it. So I was following Sergey's lead using a laser pointer, but let's use the mouse pointer instead. We can't see the join of S1 here and S2 here. That should work for you, right? So yes. the Lam and Poyovsky put in the join of this chain, which is this guy, and put in the join of this chain, which is this guy, but they don't put in the join of S1 and S2, which ought to be up here. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, so Okay, so the first approach I want to tell you about has already been spearheaded by uh, Matthew Dyer. And it's, I think, a sort of a very natural idea. It's if weak order is inversion sets with containment, then maybe we can think of something which is more general than inversion sets and think of containment about that. So inversion sets are these finite sets of positive roots. Maybe we can make some more sets of positive roots, which will be infinite, and think about containment of that. And so the question there is, how can you describe the inversion sets in terms of some properties of positive roots? And then how can you generalize that to get more of that? Okay. So following uh, Trisha's feedback, let me try pointing at things with the mouse instead of pointing at things with the laser. So let I be some set of positive roots. And then we say that I'm going to tell you about three adjectives that we can describe apply to I. And the point of these adjectives will be to characterize when I is an inversion set. We say that I is closed if whenever we have three roots alpha, beta, gamma, with gamma in the positive span of alpha and beta, then if alpha and beta are in I, then gamma is also in I. So it's closed under these sort of 
positive linear combinations of two roots. Then co-closed is the complementary condition. Co-closed is the same as complement is closed. So if alpha and beta are not an I, then gamma is not an I. And bi-closed is both closed and co-closed. And then theorem, I think this theorem should be attributed to Dyer, although it seems strange that no one had it before. The finite bi-closed sets are exactly the inversion sets. So you could describe weak order as finite bi-closed sets under containment. And then the proposal is a very natural one. You should think about all bi-closed sets ordered by inclusion. And the conjecture is that this ought to be a complete lattice. And, and I'll be getting, I, I don't know the person in the back of who, who asked this, but I agree another natural thing to do would be to look at all regions of hyperplane arrangement complement. That's not the same thing as this, and I'll explain how it's not in a few slides. Say the gamma is what? Um, okay, I have deliberately not introduced the word crystallographic onto any of my slides. If I want to answer that, I need to talk about crystallographic and I'm not sure I would get the right answer on the fly. So this is correct as written. I'm just gonna leave it as is. Okay, so here are some immediate consequences of the definitions. This is at the undergrad exercise level. You look at these definitions, you see that it follows. The intersection of closed sets is always closed. And if I have any subset of roots, it is contained in a unique smallest closed set that I'll call the closure. And then we have the complementary statements for co-closed sets. The union of co-closed sets is co-closed. And any, co -co any, uh, any set contains a unique largest co-closed set, which I'll call the interior. Okay, so I said the big con the conjecture here is, an open problem is, the post set of bi-closed set ordered by inclusion is a complete lattice. Well, complete lattice means any year subset has to have a join and a meet. A better conjecture would be to say what the join should be or what the meet should be. And so here's the formulas. The join ought to be the closure of the union, and the meet ought to be the interior of the intersection. Now, the not obvious thing is it's not obvious that the closure of the union is by closed. It's closed because it's a closure, but it's not at all clear that it's co-closed and vice versa for the other one. But if these sets are by closed, then it's very easy to check if they must be the join and the meet. So a better version of this conjecture is if you take the closure of the union, it is still co-closed. If you take the interior of the intersection, it's still closed. And there's a reason that I mentioned a slide ago that the union of co-closed things is co-closed again. That suggests that you should just strengthen this to saying, if I have any co-closed set, its closure should be co-closed. And if I have any closed set, but its interior should be closed. So I think this is the, and this is also uh, in dire, this approach is also in dire. This is really the thing you should be aiming for. Okay. So side note to address the question for a bit ago. So the question for a bit ago is maybe we should just take all the regions of hyperplane arrangement complement. Or regions is a little bit confusing when they're infinitely many hyperplanes. So let's just say, take a point not on any hyperplane. So I'm going to explain what happens if you do that and why it is not the thing to do. So take some theta, which is not on any hyperplane. And you can use that theta to form a set of positive roots, they with the positive roots that pair negatively with it. Call that X. A set X of this form is called separable. I will say theta separates X from its complement. Now inversion sets are separable, take theta and UD. And separable sets are by closed. It's immediate to see that separability implies those by closure axioms. But by closed sets don't have to be separable. And we really do want all by closed sets, not just the separable ones. Technical note, because it's going to come up later, there's a slightly more, more robust version called weakly separable. So for separable, I said, take theta not on any hyperplane. 
We also could do is take any theta at all. And then if beta pairs negative with theta, put it in the X bin. If beta pairs positive with theta, put it in the not X bin. And if beta pairs to zero with theta, choose a new theta and try again. So you could choose to take a sequence of theta one, theta two, theta three, et cetera, and allow yourself to have zero pairings the first time and then break those ties later. This is called weakly separable. It has more robust properties. It doesn't change anything important. So I have it up here so that later statements will be true, but basically you should think about it as a slightly technically nicer thing, which doesn't make any difference in the end. Okay. So what I wanna show you is an example of a bi closed set, which is not separable and which we really do want to have, which is important to include in our lattice. So I'm going to work in the affine symmetric group of rank four. I'm going to try to compute the join of S1, S2 with S3, S4. So S1, S2, that has a, that's a word of rank two, so it can correspond to an inversion set with two roots in it. They are uh, E2 minus E1 and E3 minus E1. S3, S4, the inversions are E4 minus E3 and E5 minus E3. And the recipe for computing the join is I'm supposed to take the union, that's easy, that's just four roots. And then I'm supposed to take the closure, that's harder. So what's in the closure? If you get bored, you could try and race me to the answer, but it is showing up in two more slides, so work fast. So here's some things that are in the closure. So for example, E4 minus E3 plus E3 minus E1, that's E4 minus E1, so E4 minus E1 is in the closure. E4 minus E1 plus E5 minus E3. Well, remember E4 minus E1, that's the same thing as E8 minus E5, because whenever I add four to a subscript, I add delta. So E4 minus E1 plus E5 minus E3 is E8 minus E3. So E8 minus E3 is the closure. If you keep going this way, you can build a lot of roots and work really fast if you're working on this problem. Here's the answer. The closure is all EB minus EA, where A is less than B, and A comma B mod four is in one of those, is one of those six possibilities. Uh, basically, the first one has to be one or three, and the second one has to be distinct from it. Okay, this set is by closed. Dyer tells you to use it. It is not separable. Let's see why it's not. So E5 minus E3 and E3 minus E1 are both in my set and their sum is delta. So if I had some theta that paired negatively with the things in this set, it would pair negatively with delta. And on the other hand, E6 minus E4 and E4 minus E2 are not in X and their sum is also delta. If I had some theta which paired positively with the things not in my set, it would pair positively with delta. And if you work a little harder, weak separability doesn't save you either. So this guy is by closed, it is not separable. It does not in any sense come from a region of the hyperplane arrangement complement. And we really want it. And to see why we, and in fact, we want it in the sense that if you throw it away and say, I'm only working with the separable by closed sets, then you don't get a join. There are many separable by closed sets which contain this one and none of them is minimal. So Dyer was smart, he gave us the right thing to do. This, although it seems very natural, doesn't work. Okay. I want to tell you about a little progress. So back in summer 2019, I had a very good REU student named Grant Barkley. He then went to Harvard. He's now a grad student of Warren Williams. In a few years, he could be your postdoc, and he's here. Um, and he and I worked on bi closed sets in affine coxeter groups. And then he went away. And about a year into the pandemic, he contacted me and said, I started working again. And I started working on it too. And we have a, a paper which we want to get out this summer. We have a complete classification of the bi closed sets in the affine coxeter groups. And we have checked Dyer's conjecture. And so I would be glad to tell people what the classification is, but I'm trying to get to a lot on these slides. So I'm not doing it right now. But one funny consequence of it is, in rank three, that is to say A tilde, C tilde, and G tilde, all of the bi closed sets are weakly separable. So something funny is going on in rank three. And I'll say that the way that we prove that these things are lattices, once we have our classification, is, is not just we slam out every case, but we reduce things to rank three in a pretty clever way. And then rank three is really, it turns out to be really nice. 
And so I think that studying these things in rank three is a good general strategy. And so what did I want to bring as an open problem? Do this in rank three for the hyperbolic groups. And I think the right starting place is do it in rank three for the free group. So question, are the bi-closed sets in rank three always weakly separable? What about this example of the free Coxeter group? The free Coxeter group acting on the hyperbolic plane, that's a, like an extremely classical object of modular forms. That's gamma of two. Um, it has tons of connections to number theory, to continued fractions, to fairy sequences. People know a ton about this triangulation of a hyperbolic plane. We should be able to figure out what the bi-closed sets are. And the big thing you want to prove, the big web that will basically unlock everything, is you want to check that if you have four hyperbolic lines, alpha, beta, gamma, which none of them meet because the hyperbolic plane that can happen, and they're arranged circularly like this. Yes, these are four lines in, in my reflection arrangement. You want to check that you can't have a bi closed set that contains alpha and gamma but not beta and delta. So it's some sort of non crossing property here. Um, so I don't know how to do this, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> Um, yeah, that is the last time here. Let me pause for a sec before I tell you about Nathan reading shards. Questions, comments, thoughts people want to bring up? Probably not too, not too large of a digression from this. Okay. So I decided to try to pack in a lot and also tell you about a second approach, which is not by closed sets. This is an approach which has already been spearheaded by Nathan Reading in using his ideas about shards. So, so in order to tell you about this, I need to tell you, a little, tell you a little bit about lattice congruences. So on this slide, let lambda be a finite lattice. Footnote, finiteness is negotiable. There are other discreteness and and finiteness conditions I could put in instead, but they all take longer to state. And I want the statements on this slide to be true. So uh, this is going to be a slide about lattice congruence on finite lattices, but lattice theorists have all sorts of definitions of things that are infinite, but not too infinite for the theory to work. I just don't want to say what they are. Okay, so what is a lattice congruence? A lattice congruence is an equivalence relationship on our lattice that respects the lattice structure. So if u1 is equivalent to u2 and v1 is equivalent to v2, then u1 join v1 to be equivalent to u1 to u2 join v2 and the same for meet. So lattice congruences play the same role for lattices, that normal subgroups play for groups, that two-sided ideals play for non-commutative rings. They are the things you can quotient by and get another object of the same sort. Why should you like lattice congruences? Well, there might be all sorts of reasons, but one reason I'll give you is there's a family of lattice congruences invented by Nathan Reading called the Cambrian congruences. And one of such Cambrian congruence is a very famous one, the Tamari congruence on the symmetric group. And, and these Cambrian congruences are what show up in two of my motivating bullet points for what I would like to do with Coxeter groups. So when you describe acyclic cluster algebras, you actually describe them via a Cambrian quotient of the corresponding Coxeter group. And when you describe, so pre-projective algebras don't go through Cambrian congruences, but there's a thing which is easier than the pre-projective algebra, which is the quiver path algebra. That's both a sub-algebra and a quotient algebra of the pre-projective algebra. And when you describe the representation theory of, pre of quiver algebras, you go through the Cambrian congruence of the corresponding Coxeter group. So in two of these motivating things, these Cambrian congruences show up. And so Nathan thought, well, maybe I should read the lattice congruence literature and see what I can learn from it. This may not be an exactly accurate history. <laughs> um, okay. So what do people in the lattice congruence world know? The first thing I know is that a lattice congruence is determined by what it does on covering pairs. So a covering pair, also called an edge of the Hasse diagram, is u and v with u less than v, but there doesn't exist a w strictly between u and v. So, oh, and in a Coxeter group, this has a geometric meaning. 
UV is a covering pair if the cones UD and VD, those superficial cones border along a co-dimension one wall. And so the fact is a lattice congruence is determined by the risk of those covering pairs, which become equivalent to the congruence. Yep. <sighs> yeah, you know, I meant to add a sentence fixing that. Um, they correspond to those U and V. Okay, I don't want it to be symmetrical. The top sentence is correct. But the statement was that my statement about Cockshire groups is symmetric in U and V. And it shouldn't be. What I should say is UD and VD border along a common wall with UD on the positive side of the wall and VD on the negative side of the wall. Uh, so yeah, this, this is an ordered condition. U is less than V. Good. Okay. And so describing lattice congruences comes down to the question of figuring out which collections of, of covering pairs, which collections of edges in the Hasta diagram I'm going to, be, going to be allowed to contract. And the first step to figuring this out is that sometimes one edge implies another edge and vice versa. Sometimes we have two covering pairs, U1, V1, U2, V2, such that whenever I contract U1, V1, I must contract U2, V2 and vice versa. So I can lump them together and treat them as one. And so we're going to use this Cyrillic letter Sha for the set of covering pairs up to this equivalence. So for a finite Coxeter group, there are two sort of uh, Coxeter theoretic ways to describe Sha, which are due to a Kant. And then there is a geometric way to describe Sha, which is due to Nathan reading. So the Coxeter theoretic descriptions are that each class in Sha has a unique representative of the form J star comma J, where J is join irreducible. Or the more algebraic combinatorics where I say that is where J has exactly one descent. So these things correspond to the, per, to the permutations, the Coxeter group of exactly one descent. And then you could also do the upside down version of that. It also has exactly one representative of the form M, M star, where M is media reducible. So that's one asset. And again, this is a statement for finite Coxeter groups. <clears throat> and here is the third polyhedral description by Nathan. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of our hyperplanes and break it up into regions called shards, like shattering a plane of glass. And that's why we're using a Cyrillic letter Sha, Sha stands for shard. So what we do is we take each gamma in our positive root system, and we find all cases where gamma is in the positive span of two other roots, alpha and beta. Turns out there are only finitely many of those. And we take gamma perp and cut it along the hyper, the plane which is perpendicular to both alpha perp and beta perp. So in the type S3, this root down here, E3 minus E1, is a positive linear combination of E3 minus E2 and E2 minus E1. So we are going to take E3 minus E1 perp and cut it along the co-dimension two space, which is just the origin of this picture, which is perpendicular to both E3 minus E2 and E2 minus E1. Whereas, E2 minus E1, that's not a positive combination of any other roots. So the dual hyperplane where Z2 equals Z1 doesn't get cut at all. So the regions of this arrangement, Nathan termed shards. And the geometric meaning of them is if you think about covering pairs as UD and VD border along some cone contained in one of these hyperplanes, then U1, V1 is equivalent to U2, V2 if that bordering cone is contained in the same shard. So this is what Nathan worked out. Okay, so this is a description of Shaw for the finite Coxeter group. And it is Nathan's definition, not the joint reducible or media reducible thing, but I want to use in the infinite Coxeter group. Turns out even in the infinite Coxeter group, any gamma is only a positive linear combination of finitely many pairs alpha beta. So this is a finite hyperplane arrangement inside each gamma perp. You're getting some very discrete finite data here for a fixed, for each fixed root. 
Now, an infinite type, there are more shards than there are join slash media reducibles. But I claim that the more, but the, the theme of this talk is we want more. The more shards is what I want. Okay. So let me tell you a few things we know about shards, and then we tell you what we would like to do with them. So first of all, Hugh Thomas and I found a recursive description of shards. It's a recursion on the, uh, the root in the root poset. So what you do is if your root is a simple root, if it's an alpha i, then there's just one shard. Otherwise, you take your root dude, uh, beta and you write it as si beta prime for some smaller beta prime. And the recursion is you find all the shards for beta prime reflect them by SI and then cut any of them which cross the hyperplane alpha I perp and those give you the shards to beta. So this is actually a pretty practical computation thing. Uh, my student Will Dana, who also perhaps could be a postdoc in a few years and is also here, uh, has implemented this. It's quite nice for churning out lists of shards and he's proved a number of things about how they work. <clears throat> um, Hugh and I also found a representation theoretic description in, so in terms of the pre-projective algebra, there's a notion of a stability domain for a module over the pre-projective algebra, which has to do with what degrees you find its semi-invariance in. And there's a class of modules for which these are exactly the stability domains. Uh, specifically, they are the real bricks, for those who sort of know this representation theory language, whose domain of stability is n minus one dimensional. For a while, we wondered, well, does every real brick have n minus one dimensional stability domain? But my student Will found a counterexample to that. So just impose that on the slide as well. Okay, so, so those are some of the things we know about shards. Did I take away the, uh, the part of the slide which is going to have a problem? So problem, probably just on a later slide, but problem, first of all, even if you don't like representation theory, don't like Coxeter groups, these are some hyperplane arrangements you should prove things about. In type A, they're really simple. In type A, EC minus EA is just cut by uh, the appropriate number, I think it's C minus A plus one of uh, transverse hyperplanes and you just get something that looks like orthogonal coordinates. But in other types, B, D, and then the affine types and then the hyperbolic types, we really don't know what's going on. Uh, Kyle Peterson has done some work on figuring out enumeration of shards of type B and D. Uh, Nathan Reading has some students here, uh, such as Ashley uh, Tarp, I believe her last name was, who's thought some about this. My student Will has also thought some about this, but like all these questions you would like to ask about a hyperplane arrangement, like point counts, you know, regions, everything you ask about a hyperplane arrangement, these are some interesting hyperplane arrangements you could probably prove something about. Okay. Um, having said that, what I want to do with the last few slides is say, how would we want to use shards to build a larger extension of the Coxeter group? So again, in fun. If we go back to finite type, shards are in bijection with both join irreducibles and media reducibles, which gives us two post natural post set structures on shards the restriction of weak order to the join irreducibles, the restriction of weak order to the media reducibles. And we suggest calling those two restrictions onto and into because, in the representation theoretic context, they correspond to there is a surjection and there is an injection of the modules. And we define X arrow Z if there's a surge action followed by an injection. And then theorem me with Nathan Reading and Hugh Thomas, again, this is all finite Coxeter groups. The finite Coxeter group corresponds to sets of pairs of shards X comma Y, which are maximal with respect to the property that there is no arrow from X to Y. So you can't either add anything to X to make it larger or add anything to Y to make it larger. And the dimensions of the shards in X and in Y are the inversions and the non-inversions respectively. So Matthew Dyer would just take the positive roots and split them into X and X complement. We have some extra data. We don't just have the positive roots. We have the shards of those dimension vectors and they go into this natural pair of things. And so what would we want to do? Well, we would want to do something like this in the infinite types, we would want to define some sort of relationships so that we get a complete lattice of pairs and we would want it to be compatible with the bi-closed sets. We would want it that when you 
take the dimensions of the shards in X and the dimensions of the shards in Y, you get a bi-closed set of its complement. And one could also want to do this in reverse. One could want to say, give it a bi-closed set, are there some pairs of shards? And then, yeah, it looks like I'm missing, but if you don't like all this lattice theory, just you should be studying these shard arrangements as hyperplane arrangements. They're interesting ones. You should do something with that. And that is where I want to stop. Thank you. Next questions? Yes. I certainly, the question was, are these lattices by closed set semi-distributed? So semi-distributivity is a property of lattices which makes a lot of this theory work. And my answer is that's certainly what I expect. I don't really, I don't know a counterexample to that. I don't really want to claim to have checked it because it's sort of a big infinite question. I don't know how to seriously search for a counterexample to it. But yes, that is what I expect is that these should be semi-distributed and in fact, they should be completely semi-distributed which is a little bit stronger lattices. Yes. Sure. This one. I just wasn't sure what name I should be putting for that statement. Oh, what, what is his wife's name? I'm sorry, I just slide her. Hiltington? Bilkington. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad that I asked because now it's time to know. Okay, thank you. Well, are there other questions, comments, things? So what's the status of biospace projection? Like, what's the. Um, what, is it not for like when we work with your. I think that. Um, the question is, what's the status on, on this Dio conjecture? I think that what Grant and I have done is pretty much what's been done. There's also been some other work on bi closed sets by a bunch of people, but I don't think they've actually read to the checking of more cases. Uh, please correct me if I'm sliding anyone here. Uh, so I, I think, I don't think free Coxner groups is done. I think. That's 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 why I put on here. Three cultural groups should be done. Um, I always, whenever I say something hasn't been done, I worry that I'm dumb and have missed it. But I don't think it's been done. One more question. Uh, where? Thank you. Yes. A, character, a characterization of what's happening in type A? Like the added top element. Oh, the, the top element should be the bi closed set of all roots. Yeah, so the question was what's the element at the top of the lattice? And this one does have a very, the element at the top of the lattice here. That, that, that's very quick. That is the set of all roots is bi closed. So that's what that is. You're welcome. All right, if there's no more question, let's thank David for such a nice talk.